I've been working on comparative politics of Southeast Asia, but particularly the politics of Thailand for quite a long time now. Um, many years ago, I, I went and spent an intensive period of time studying Thai language and then pursued graduate work and wrote a PhD thesis about the politics of Thailand. So over the years, I've, I've worked on a number of different book projects about different aspects of Thailand's politics, and I have rather opportunistically uh, jumped onto whatever seemed to me to be most important, most pressing, most topical and salient at a particular time, which means I've changed my topic quite a lot over the years. I haven't stuck rigidly with one particular thing because Thailand's a multifaceted place and there are lots of different things going on. Uh, while I was doing field work for my last project, which was about the insurgency in Batami and the southern border provinces of Thailand, I ended up going to court to follow a couple of court cases. And then I began to realize that the judicial system was a very, very interesting phenomenon and, and raised a lot of questions about the nature of power in Thailand. After that, um, the judicial system really came to the fore with a set of public debates about judicialization to like um, Iwat in Thai, uh, following two speeches by the, the then king, the late king Pumipon uh, in April 2006, where he called upon the judges to solve Thailand's political problems. So that's really the starting point for the book. You have uh, a bunch of judges who are not really used to solving political problems, who've been told that that's something they should be doing, and they certainly get on with it because uh, in fairly short order, um, you know, an election result is annulled, political parties start to be banned, um, quite a few people are, are hauled in on various charges relating to freedom of expression. So the, the judicial system, the work of the courts, whether it's the criminal courts or the uh, constitutional court, becomes one of the main centers of contestation and focus of interest in Thailand's politics. The problem when people ask me questions like, what's been going on in Thailand over the past few years politically, is there's really a lot, uh, a ridiculous number of things have been going on. So we had a military coup in 2006 and another one in 2014. We had an election in 2006, which was annulled by the courts as was the election in 2014. But we also had an election which went ahead uh, and was not annulled by the courts in 2007 and in 2011. We also had mass street protests against the former Thaksin government, uh, the Apisit government and the Yingluck government. So we had thousands of people out on the streets of Bangkok sort of blocking the roads and occupying buildings. And this happened in 2006. It happened to a lesser extent uh, in 2008-9 on a very big scale in 2010 and then again in 2013-14. So uh, meanwhile we also have a couple of constitutional referendums took place within that decade uh, on new constitutions that have been drafted following military coups um, and lots of court cases and um, a couple of very important political parties being banned and dissolved as well as other court decisions that have a lot of political ramifications. So the question really is what wasn't happening during this 10 year period. It's, it's a bewildering trying to follow this sequence of events. And I think for many ordinary ties who found themselves implicated in, caught up in, and the, the, the victims of this, what became really a very dysfunctional polarized politics, um, they've been really struggling to make sense of it. And those of us who are scholars um, working on Thailand but not living in Thailand all the time, we've been having a lot of problem following as well uh, because there's just so much happening and it's so ridiculously complicated and ridiculously confusing. Um, so yeah, I think probably when I started studying the politics of Thailand and wrote a PhD thesis about it almost 30 years ago, I had thought that uh, you know, going forward, things will become a little bit more straightforward and a little bit more predictable. But unfortunately, Thailand is, is no more straightforward and predictable uh, than it was 30 years ago. Uh, and there are so many new complicating factors that keep coming into the equation with this 
effectively this judicialization or whatever you want to call it, this greater involvement of the courts in politics being just one uh, of those things that happened. So it's a fascinating part of the picture, but you also can't understand it uh, without having some grasp of the, the very messy electoral politics, the very messy street protest politics, the military coups, the new constitutions, and overshadowing all this, a massive contestation between two, if you like, very crudely competing sets of forces, the, the forces supporting former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, who was ousted in the 2006 coup, his sister Yinglak, who was ousted as Prime Minister in the 2014 coup. So this is the so-called red side, and then the yellow side supporting the monarchy, the military, the bureaucracy, and a more conservative view of Thai society. So these two sides have been slugging it out in a variety of parliamentary, extra parliamentary, legal and extra legal arenas uh, for more than a decade now. And it's been absolutely fascinating, but it's one rough helter skelter of a political ride. Fighting for virtue is actually a phrase from uh, one of the King's speeches that he gave in April 2006, he said that the judges should be fighting for virtue. Um, the exact meaning of fighting for virtue, of course, depends uh, on how you choose to interpret and understand the, the phrase. Um, the idea of virtue, Kwan Bi, and, and the quest for good people, Kwan Bi, in Thai, to, to play an important mediating role uh, in society is a very fundamental idea that comes up again and again. Of course, as a social scientist um, and someone who's trying to understand time analytic analytically, you know, I'm tearing my non-existent hair out trying to work out what uh, a virtuous person or a good person is and how a person could be engaged in this task of fighting for virtue. Because, uh, what the notion of fighting for virtue does, if you're not very careful, is reduce a set of very complicated political and social problems to a, a very simple moral mission and moral imperative. Uh, so the problem with fighting for virtue, it sounds, it sounds like a good idea to be on the side of good against the side of evil. I think all of us would like to be uh, fighting for good or against, against evil in this world. But, you know, uh, Thai judges are not Batman. And, um, Fighting for good against evil is, is often not terribly straightforward. For example, if you decide to ban a particular political party which has been engaged in some problematic behavior, you're going to alienate the possibly millions of people who support that party. And when you do that, you undermine the legitimacy of the Thai state, especially if you don't ban parties from the other side of the political fence at the same time. So you're then seen as heavy handedly having favored one political side over another. And that in turn undermines the idea of a public good and undermines the idea of the judiciary or other state actors as neutral arbiters of a collective uh, interest. So this is a fundamental problem, that the idea of fighting for virtue, uh, beguiling and attractive though it might seem, has within it the seeds of a great deal of difficulty. Uh, when you have people who don't really think very analytically about how to, how to interpret that. And part of the problem, and I talk about this in the book, is that the Thai judiciary, for the most part, they're very well-intentioned, they got to be judges by passing an extremely difficult, fiendishly difficult entrance exam, usually when they're about 25 years old. And they then go straight into the judiciary and become judges for the rest of their life. And the grade that they get, the ranking that they get when they take that entrance exam will determine their future careers. If you come number one in the entrance exam when you're 25, you're highly likely to end up being this, the president of the Supreme Court uh, when you approach 60. So your career is set. So this means that Thai judges are not like judges, say, in the United States or, or the UK. They don't have previous careers in law. They haven't had extensive experience of uh, being on the other side of court cases of either defending or prosecuting cases. Most of them have absolutely never done such a thing. They have a fairly limited life experience 
and they don't have either a very strong intellectual tradition. Uh, in many countries, judges are quite intellectually oriented. They may write articles or books about their specialist fields. They're encouraged to develop specialist areas of expertise. Um, those kind of things are not encouraged in the Thai system, which is a generalist, bureaucratized mode of judicial work. So that means that as judges rise up to the Supreme Court, or they have to uh, make judgments in extremely complicated and in these cases politically sensitive uh, areas, they don't have a lot of background and they don't have a lot of experience of thinking about those things, nor do they have a culture of sitting down and having abstract discussions, bringing in experts who might be able to elucidate problems, to train them, to think about these issues. It's not a, a the idea of continuous education and self-improvement isn't a model that most Thai judges are working on. So what many of them find is that when they reach these extremely senior positions and they're judging cases of monumental importance for the future of the country, they don't have um, really the level of background and experience to base those very, very difficult uh, decisions on. And that is a real problem because you're expecting people to make decisions based on their virtue. And of course, what you need is not just people who are virtuous and of course, a corrupt judiciary will be a disaster. So in that sense, you do want a virtuous judiciary. But the virtuous people also need not just to have been very smart once when they were 25 and qualified to become judges. They need to be very smart today because they need to have constantly updated uh, their knowledge and challenged themselves intellectually to keep up with the latest legal developments worldwide, to keep up with what's going on in their own societies and political systems. And that's not... Um, a way in which most Thai judges are accustomed to thinking. So when they were instructed to help solve Thailand's political problems, this was a mission which, whatever the, their degree of virtue, they weren't very well equipped intellectually and in terms of experience to carry out. So they've been given a mission that's really, in many cases, rather beyond their abilities. And that put them in a very, I think, unenviable situation.